Discovering new exoplanets is, is really one of the most exciting things for me as a scientist. Um, it really gives us uh, a new perspective on our place in the universe. You know, we've, we've wondered about this for hundreds of years. Are there other planets? Are there, is there life on other planets? And we've kind of just been thinking in the dark until recently. And now we have actual numbers. We can see other planets orbiting other stars. We can see enough of them to work out how many of them could potentially support life. This is for the first time in human history. We can put a number and say, you know, there's 10 billion Earth-sized planets with the potential for liquid water in our galaxy alone. And that number just uh, boggles my mind. I think in, in music, there's like, there's like an emotion for everything. So like when I listen to certain songs, I can like remember like hearing like eight days a week for the first time and like my parents dancing to it. There is definitely also an aesthetic element that drives it as well, or that drives physicists toward ideas that are simple and that are beautiful. TRAPPIST-1 has this remarkable planetary system with seven nearly Earth-sized planets. He comes in my office and he says, you know, Dan, turn the TRAPPIST system into music because there's all these relationships between the orbits. And then he's like, let's try and figure out a way to take this, turn it into something that we can show people what TRAPPIST sounds like. People immediately feel something when they listen to the music. And they know they're not just listening to any music, they're listening to the music of a planetary system. And so it immediately evokes a, a deep connection with what's going on in a solar system 40 light years away. We found some exoplanets in the late 80s, Dave Latham did, but he was very cautious, so he didn't say that it was necessarily an exoplanet. The first one that people really said were exoplanets and were believed were in 1992. They were discovered around a pulsar, which is a neutron star that's spinning. The first planet that was discovered around a star similar to our, our sun was back in 1995. And they trickled in for a few years, and then there was a huge explosion, basically, in, in 2014, when the first major results of the Kepler mission came through. And so most planets have been found with the Kepler mission. And we're up to about 3,000 confirmed exoplanets right now, and another 2,000 that are really good candidates. You know, we're finding thousands of planets out there. So finally, now we can sort of start doing statistics. You can ask bigger questions like, how frequent are planets around other stars? How many planets are there in our galaxy? When you go out and you do these statistics, you find that something like uh, every star in our galaxy, on average, has planets around it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, that, that shouldn't be surprising. You know, we find ourselves in the solar system. Presumably, we're not some enormous exception. Uh, presumably, most stars should have planets, uh, but but you can't know until you go out and look. First planets were discovered by, by looking for these wobbles from planets that are going around. So the early ones were found with, it's called the radial velocity method, which just means that if you have a relatively massive planet and a star, um, they're really orbiting their common center of mass. So the star tugs on the planet, the planet tugs on the star, and even though you can't see the planet, you can see the wobbling of the star. Either around pulsars by pulsar timing, pulsar emits pulses of radio waves very regularly. And because the planets are orbiting the star, the star has a little bit of a reflex motion. And so the pulses arrive a little earlier, a little later, depending where the planet is. And so that was how they found the first ones. And you do the same thing with light from a star, measuring a Doppler shift, a velocity shift, by looking at the locations of spectral lines. The, the shifts in light that you measure, they're, they're something like, like, like a part in a million. You need to do a really, really precise measurement. So it took a lot of technology development to get our instruments to that level. But you need a really massive planet to wobble a star. And so the first planets we found were basically Jupiters. So that was where the first several hundred exoplanets were found. And once you find some planets, then it's a lot easier to write proposals to develop better instruments to develop the technology. So that brought a lot of money into the field. Then we found a few, what are called microlensing events. It hasn't been as effective, but it helps us find planets that are further away from their star. And the other method is direct imaging. They are, it is possible to take a picture 
of a planet now. It turns out that that is extremely challenging because the star that's right next to the planet is a million to a billion times brighter than the body that you're looking for, right? So it's like look, trying to find a Christmas light right next to an enormous like stadium floodlight. But the technology is getting to the point that that's starting to become possible for the biggest planet. Several thousand were found by looking for transits where the planet crosses between its host star and the Earth and we see the light from the star dim just a little bit. The reason we found so many more planets in the last several years is because of one instrument, the Kepler Space Telescope. And what it did was pretty straightforward. It just stared at a patch of the sky where they were looking at, I forget, 70,000 or 100,000 stars, continuously. It means we're looking for every time a planet gets in the way of its star, and it blocks out a little bit of the light. And so if we're just measuring the total amount of light we get from a star, um, we can see little winks, little dips in the brightness every time a planet goes around. And so if we just stare at, you know, 100,000 stars for a few months, some of them are going to wink at us periodically. And that means there's a planet going around that star. Every one of these detection methods, you only get limited information. So for example, when you have the planet that's crossing in front of the star and blocking out some of the light, you get very basic information. You get how long does the planet get to go around because you measure that time between the dips. You also get to measure how big the planet is, right? Because the bigger the planet is, the bigger a fraction of the star's disk it covers, and the bigger the dip that you see uh, in the light curve. From there, we can use Kepler's law to work out how far it is from the star. If we know its period, and we know how massive the star is, we can work out how far the planet is. And of course, if we know the type of star we're looking at, which isn't too hard to find, we know its temperature, we can work out where the planet would have to be to support liquid water. That's the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone. And so all from the transit method, if we can see a planet pass in front of its star a few times, we can get all of that information about its orbit. But where you get the most information is when you can combine these different methods, right? So if you see the planet passing in front of the star, and then you can go back and you can try to measure the wobble on the star, then you can additionally measure the mass of the planet. So you got the size from the transits, and now from the wobble, you can get the masses. So that's sort of the, the gold standard. Current observations are very biased to finding things that are close to the star. It's very hard to find things that are about the distance of the Earth away from the sun. Radial velocity is very difficult, and transits are unlikely to find such things. Direct imaging right now is hopeless for an Earth mass body. So we don't have a hell of a lot of information on the distribution, but it looks to me like the claim is normally that there's about an equal number of planets per decade of radius. So that would mean if you think there are planets between you know, a few day orbits and several thousands or tens of thousands of days, then maybe like a quarter of planets are gonna be in habitable zones. Right, so as a consequence of that, most of the planets that we've found are extremely, extremely hot. They can be at thousands of degrees. Uh, so those are not good places to go looking for life. So it's really a substantial minority of planets that are far enough from their star that, that they could have sort of the right temperatures to host liquid water. So only about 12 of the planets we've found so far are in the so-called Goldilocks zone. The closest planet that's in the habitable zone is orbiting the closest star to the Earth, Proxima Centauri b. TRAPPIST-1 is one of the 300 closest stars to us, and it's puny. It's 12 times less massive than the Sun. It's about the size of Jupiter, and it's barely hot enough to fuse hydrogen, so it's barely a star. It's putting out less than a thousandth the energy of the Sun, and it's putting out almost no light in the visible spectrum. So TRAPPIST-1 isn't visible with the naked eye. Even though it's a relatively close star, it's so cool and red that our eyes can't see it. Basically, you need night vision goggles to see it. It's putting out most of its light in the infrared. So if we, if we could travel the TRAPPIST-1 and look at it, it would look very dim and red to our eyes. But it's got seven planets around it that we know of. So that makes it really interesting. We have, depending on how you count, eight or nine planets around the sun, uh, but they're out to orbits that are 30 times the radius of the Earth's orbit. This system has seven planets, but it's all in a, an orbit which is they're all inside of something which is less than a tenth of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so it's really compact. So it's really close to us, which means it's a prime target in our search for life because we have the technology that will let us 
peer into its atmosphere and find out the composition of the atmosphere. Is there oxygen there? Are there other biosignatures that might indicate the presence of life? We can do that with TRAPPIST because it's so close. I say fairly nearby, it's 12 parsecs away, which is like 36 light years. And uh, the nearest stars are, you know, several or about a parsec away. Uh, and the size of the Milky Way, the galaxy we live in, is eight kiloparsecs, 8,000 parsecs. Well, that's how far we are from the center. So that gives you an idea. We're 8,000 parsecs from the center of the galaxy, which means we're out in the sticks, right? And in our neighborhood, 12 parsecs away is, is TRAPPIST-1, so it's very nearby. It means that the next generation of telescopes, like uh, the James Webb, uh, will actually be able to analyze their atmospheres. It'll be able to look for things like oxygen, things like ozone, signs that, at least on our planet, tell us that there's life on the surface. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement around this system right now. There was this big puzzle in the original paper that when they actually took the observed system and they tried to simulate their orbits, the system fell apart. If you just took the measured periods of the TRAPPIST planets and you tried to assemble your own TRAPPIST-1 system, you just put them down where we know they are and let the clock run, unless you finely tuned that very precisely, over time the planet's tugs are going to add up on each other. So every time TRAPPIST-B goes next to TRAPPIST-C, it's going to give a little tug, and over time those are going to build up, and so it's going to pull the orbits away from being circular. It's going to pull these orbits into elliptical, oval-shaped orbits, which means they'll be crossing each other. So they'd collide and destroy the whole system. And that would take less than a million years, which is very short, astronomically speaking. In one thousandth of the age of the system, the planets started crashing into one another. What are the chances that we would catch the system at this extremely special time right before it just completely blows apart? And that makes no sense because the stars, we don't know the age that well, but it's probably of order of billions of years old, which means it's been stable for a long time. So if you integrate it and it's unstable, you're doing something wrong. Okay, so probably it's not the integration because we actually know how to do that. So there's something wrong with the initial conditions that you're picking. They're not, they don't correspond to the actual positions of the planets right now today. So Dan had the good idea of saying, well, one of the ways we think you make systems like this is that you move the planets towards the star when they form. So what motivated us was, you know, could we find a different way in which the system could be stable? And his idea was to say, okay, let's try building up the system by spreading them out near where their current orbits are, then moving the outer planet inward, migrating, so that it captures the inner planets sequentially into resonance and seeing then, if you do it that way, whether you then integrate those types of systems forward, whether they'd be stable. And he did the integrations and showed, in fact, that if you do this, that most of the systems that you form that way, more than half, are stable for at least a few million years to tens of millions of years. We're interested in simulating for such long timescales that each of these simulations takes, takes over a week to run. So we're completely computationally limited in how much we can simulate. Now, if you gave me, you know, the age of the Earth in computing time, uh, I could answer the questions exactly, but we sort of, we have to do what we can. And what was really intriguing about it is that they all appeared to be in mean motion resonances, or at least very close to mean motion resonances. A resonance, everybody knows from their childhood experience, if you've ever been on a swing, you understand resonance. A swing, if you just, you know, push yourself off the ground, you'll swing back and forth with a certain frequency. And that frequency doesn't matter whether you're you know, just barely moving or swinging way up and down. It's just set by gravity and the length of the swing. Okay. Now, what's a resonance? Well, you can start on a swing barely moving. If you push yourself off, you'll swing for a little while and then you'll stop. But if you know how the trick, you can swing your legs so that you won't stop. You'll actually make your motion get higher and higher. Basically, you have to swing your legs either at the same frequency as the swing or twice as fast as the frequency of the swing. That's a resonance. For every two times the outer planet goes around its star, the next one in does three orbits, then the next one in does four, then the next one in does six, nine, 15, 24. Uh, it's just like, like watching a little clock go around. Maybe we, we'll see two or three planets in a resonance like that. But we have all seven here, all locked in this tight resonant pattern. And so that's interesting from a theorist perspective because that makes us think something interesting happened in its formation that didn't happen in other systems. And resonances are really interesting because they have a lot of complicated behavior, which is 
difficult to understand, but you can, in fact, get a lot of understanding of it. So it's an intriguing physical system. If you put a relatively massive planet in a disk of gas, even something like the Earth, um, the gravity of the planet affects the disk. It distorts it a little, and then that distortion affects the planet. And so they're, they're, um, they're applying forces on each other. And so the way it works out, if, if, you, if you put a planet in a disk, in a certain mass range, it'll slide inwards slowly, over a million years, say. And in a certain other mass range and with other conditions, it may slide outwards. And what it does depends very sensitively on the conditions in the disk, which are very poorly understood right now. So we know that planets migrate through disks. There's very clear evidence for disk migration. For instance, the hot Jupiters we find that are just hugging up against their central stars. There's no way a hot Jupiter can form where it is. There's not enough material there. It must have formed further out and migrated in. And the TRAPPIST-1 system provides more compelling evidence that planets really do migrate when they're first forming. All seven of those planets must have formed a little further out and slid into place. If you want an orchestra to sound good, it's not enough for the different members to keep time with one another. At the beginning, they also have to tune their instruments to one another so that um, it sounds good. Right? So in the same way planetary systems, they don't just have to get the period ratios right to keep repeating, but you also have to tune these additional parameters, like the orbital ellipticities. Otherwise, you're going to get an unharmonious planetary system. That's where all the chaos comes in and leads to the, to the really violent, destructive outcome. Pythagoras was a, was a Greek mathematician and geometer, and most school students know him for Pythagorean theorem, which relates to triangles. Pythagoras was uh, credited with, uh, with understanding the idea that musically pleasing uh, combinations of sound were, uh, were sounds where the pitches were in uh, simple whole number ratios. You realize that if you look at lengths of string that sound good together, that make a chord, for instance, they were all integer multiples of each other's lengths. So for instance, if you take a string, play a note, cut it in half, play another note, those two notes will sound good together. If you cut it into thirds, that'll sound good as well. Always in these nice whole number ratios. And so he realized this deep connection between math and simple ratios and music, and immediately imagined that this was connected to the celestial sphere and the motion of the planets and the sun. An interesting thing happens when you have uh, uh, two strings that can both vibrate at some frequency that uh, if, I, if I pluck one string here, so right now I have this, I have this instrument where I have, I have actually three strings that are all tuned to the same frequency. If I pluck one string and then stop it, you're still hearing a little bit of sound because what's happening is that there is just a very weak connection between these two strings through the air and through the wood of the instrument. And so um, it's easy to transfer energy from one string to another that has the same natural frequency of vibration. And that is related to what's happening in the TRAPPIST-1 system. As one planet passes the next in its orbit, uh, its gravitational pull is giving the other planet just a slight kick, okay? But it's, it's repeating in exactly the same way uh, during every period, so that over time that adds up. And so that allows them to kind of settle into an orderly pattern somewhat similar to what's happening when you get what's called sympathetic vibrations of strings or, or resonance. Pattern of whole number ratios is it's the basis of, of harmony and the basis of rhythm. And so, you know, from my, my days studying music, that was completely obvious to me. And from my days studying astrophysics, the, the kind of rhythmic nature and the scientific importance of the system was obvious. I knew it'd be easy to put together. <laughs> I could get the music of the spheres and I knew it would be uh, it'd be more beautiful than any other system that we've had today. And Matt works next door to me as he does. 
So one day he, he comes in my office and he says, you know, Dan, I had this idea that, that I think we should turn the Trappist system into music because there's all these relationships between the orbits. I'm not sure how to go about simulating the system to sort of get the right times and everything. Do you know how I could uh, use some of your um, integration simulation codes to, to do this? By that point, I had hundreds of these simulations that had already run. So Matt's friend Dan found a way to just take the data already and output it as a MIDI file that we could then run into Logic. So we took that and Matt had came up with just like a basic piano sound that was like detuned correctly to like the scalings of the planets. And he just showed it to me and it already sounded like a really cool like piece of contemporary music. I was like really drawn into it and then he's like, let's try and figure out a way to take this and turn it into more of a song. Uh, and then we worked together for the next few months along with my, my bandmate Andrew. And so we have Dan on one side working on the, the computer code that simulates the Trappist system and outputs notes for every time a planet goes around, for instance. And then we have uh, my bandmate Andrew working with me on the music side. And I was kind of in the middle trying to, to meld the two worlds into a, you know, a, a simple, simple coherent package that would really accentuate the, the beauty of this system in a musical form. Most obviously, when you have this pattern of how long each planet takes to go around, that means that the system is going to be very rhythmic. Like you can't just take it and put it onto a random sound and have that necessarily sound good. Matt had the idea that, you know, all the sounds that we hear correspond to particular frequencies. Each of the planets also has a frequency with which it goes around the star. It's just a really low frequency, right? It takes days for these planets to go around the star. So what Matt tried was, well, why don't we increase the orbital frequencies by a factor of 200 million so that you can actually hear them. Um, so you're, you're, you're literally translating the, the motions of the planets into, into sound, into music. He wanted to use like conjunctions, like when two planets crossed each other. So we thought we could put that into like a drum sound. And then we just thought of a way to slowly build the song. So like, you're not just hitting everyone with everything at once. And it's because of these very special ratios between the orbital periods um, that you get a really musical progression between the notes. Right? Uh, when the frequency doubles, that corresponds to going an octave higher. When the frequency goes up by 50%, you get a fifth. You know, if you put in a random system through that process, it would sound atrocious. Uh, but Trappist actually gives you something close to what a human might put together. Right? It's, it's a little bit off, which tells you that it's it's real, right? It gives it like its own sort of signature. So when you think of astronomy, you probably think of beautiful pictures. We had this other way to experience astronomy, and that's through sound and music, to give an experiential way to understand the pattern in the Trappist-1 system. All I do for my research is, is think about these resonances, uh, and then I try to explain it to people, and it's sort of hard, it's like really abstract, thing, you know, after you hear it, it's so obvious, right? Like you could, you could just turn it into music and that's something that somebody can immediately grasp. Like we've never made a video before, so we're just trying to figure out like the most basic way to show what each note is doing. So I found like a program that, out, that you can um, record the video of the MIDI. So like a MIDI note passes by and it lights up when it hits. So we took that as like the guide for people to see what is happening with the notes. In Dan's program, it output a, uh, the planet system, like what is going on with the notes as well, like when the planet circles or rotates and when it lights up when it hits. It was kind of just like a really simple idea.
I think it sounds exciting when I listen to it. To my ears, it sounds very mechanical in some ways, but very human in other ways. It keeps evolving as you go through. And those progressions of ratios of, of frequencies or sounds, it does remind you of that. That's what it is. So you get these run-throughs uh, at different points in the song that, that sound exactly like, like what, you know, what somebody might try to compose and then it disappears. The notes aren't perfectly tuned and that's because the planetary orbits aren't perfectly tuned. They've drifted over the last few billion years due to tidal forces. Those kind of imperfections are what really get me. It was like shown to you a bit, like through the data, so it's exciting for like what else is out there that like makes a sound that you would never think of. The most important feedback I got was from someone who's blind and thanked us for giving her a way to experience astronomy like she's never had before. And so that one comment really made the difference for me and we've been reaching out to other, other blind people and communities that help the blind and the visually impaired as a way for them to experience space. Right away I thought it sounded like uh, something Steve Reich would have done. So he's famous for these semi-mechanical explorations of repeating pianos and so the first bit of trapeze sounds is a very mechanical repeating but slightly twisted piano medley and it's very similar to some of the work that Steve Reich did decades ago. There's a certain connection with minimalism I think uh, like uh, you know Steve Reich or Philip Glass with the uh, repeating patterns. There's been a, a large community of scientists and science and science educators that have reached out to me and they, they see the value of, of this kind of project. The, the Globe and Mail ran a story, New York Times, Washington Post. Base.com also picked it up and our friends at Thought Cafe did a video along with us. Motherboard and my favorite is really Quirks and Quirks. This is a, a science show on CBC that I grew up listening to with my dad. It's one of the reasons I went into science. So to be able to be on that show is a huge deal for me. To me, Trappist means that there's still like so much opportunity to learn like so much more about our universe. Why don't things just happen randomly? Why do there have to be some set of rules that everything follows? You probably wouldn't go into physics if you didn't think it was beautiful. And the greatest proponent of that is of course Einstein, who thought that physics had to be beautiful. And he used that as a guide to find his general theory of relativity, which is the most beautiful theory that I know of. That the laws of physics are simple, right? We can comprehend them and we can write them down, but they're complex enough, there's enough subtlety in that, that simple rules can lead to very wide, different complex results. For whatever reason, harmonic progressions are pleasing to human beings. Presumably there's something evolutionarily useful about this. I don't know what it would be though. Like, why do we enjoy music? That's like, makes zero sense. There's nothing useful about listening to music, you wouldn't think if you're a Plains 8 running around, right, trying to make a living. Uh, but we like music and we like chords which consist of notes that have frequencies that are resonantly related. One very important theme in the history of physics is unification. It's finding deeper and deeper layers so that you have less and less and simpler parts and assumptions explaining more and more of the complexity of the world. And so you might wonder if that ever comes to an end. Can we find a general theory, a theory of everything, where we can write down some equations on paper and they would tell us the fundamental laws that underlie all of nature. And we don't know if that's possible. There may be just an endless regression of deeper and deeper theories. There's, there's no law in the universe that says it has to be understandable to us and that we have to be able to find some bottom layer. Although there's very enticing clues that point in that direction. The universe is, is just, it's able to be much more creative than, than anything that we as people could have come up with ahead of time. There's something about patterns and about symmetries that the human brain finds compelling and beautiful. That's what math is all about, is about finding deeper patterns and deeper connections and deeper symmetries in nature. And so we can use our own sense of beauty as a guide. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it does and the results are incredible.